And when we saw him, we started screaming, JJ, JJ. That a coup will not succeed if the atmosphere, the climate is not calling for it. He told Ghanaians, I have hard work for you. Christianize me, if you may, but don't try to Europeanize me. In June 1979, Ghana was at a crossroad. Another military coup was at hand. A young Air Force pilot who a few weeks before had been court-martialed and was awaiting execution was broken out of jail by his colleagues to lead what would be later known as the June 4th Revolution. Little was known of this man who would later be instrumental in changing the future of Ghana forever. His name? Jerry Rawlings. Jerry Rawlings was born in Accra, Ghana, on the 22nd of June, 1947, to his mother, Victoria Abokchui, and his Scottish father, James Ramsey. He attended Ghana's prestigious Achimota School, an elite school at the time. Achimota was founded on the principle of providing African students with the British model of a public education. The school boasts of an impressive alumni with Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, Gambia's Sadawada Jawara, and Zimbabwe's president, Robert Mugabe, all being former students at different times in the school's history. I must say that it probably was one of the finest times of my life. You know, it's modern school. It's a place to be proud of. I noticed him, yes, because he was very visible and bullied us even though we were in the same class. Not in a very bad way, but you know, bullying is bullying. And um, so uh, you can't help but notice him. But I never thought that we will come this far. By collective effort, that the nation's problems can be solved. Before his fame as a revolutionary, Jerry Rawlings was unknown to most of Ghana. In March 1968, he began his training as a pilot officer. I wanted to fly from the age of six. Honest. I was standing next to my mother, you know, in a compound house, when the young men also in the house, you know, asked me what I'd like to be when I grew, grew up. And I said, I'd like to be a pilot. And Bang! My mother slapped me on the back. Oh, yes, yes. You'll be a doctor. You'll be a scientist. I mean, the whole house, the compound became quiet, shocked at what had just happened. I never gave up my dream. He graduated in January 1969 and was commissioned a pilot officer. And because of his exceptional skill, he won the coveted Speed Bird Trophy. The Speed Bird Trophy went to Lieutenant J.J. Rawlings for being the best Air Force cadet of the flying training school. I won the Speed Bird Trophy. In those days, we didn't have, have televisions. You know, we had what they called the newsreels in movie houses. But my mother was not interested. He earned the rank of Flight Lieutenant in April of 1978. The early years of independence in Ghana were filled with great hope for the future, with the country's first president, Kwame Nkrumah's leadership, set to catapult Ghana into a new era. But over the years, Nkrumah's regime became less accommodating and declared the nation a one-party state. 
while on a state visit to Vietnam and China in 1966, Nkrumah was deposed from power in a coup. I was at school. So how did the people around him, how did they conduct or misconduct themselves in such a way as to bring so much hatred to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah? What followed was a period of military coups, failed civilian governments that left the people dissatisfied. Widespread corruption made life difficult for the people of Ghana. This led to growing anger and resentment. Ghana then, everything was monopolized. I remember our basic food like beans and gari was only sold, I remember at that time Malata was sold by one woman. One, believe you me, one person was selling that, only one. There was no soap. Just bath and soap, there was none. Toothpaste, there was none. Nothing. No food. And we got to know that Ghana was almost just getting to a ground. But the point is that we have set the example. We have shown that we're capable of doing it. Jerry Rowlings came into the public eye when on the 28th of May 1979, Rowlings, together with six other soldiers, were arrested by the militia for an attempted coup d'etat on the government of General Fred Akufo. Rawlings appeared before a general court-martial charged with leading a squad of soldiers on the 15th of May 1979. I keep describing it as turning on the gas in a kitchen. That's how volatile it was. From a distance, all you needed to do was to ignite a match and throw it inside. And that's what I could have done in 79, 15th May. I was praying for the best. I also knew exactly what was going on in the country and knew that he had taken the flag for all of us. Therefore, if he had to die for his conviction, I knew he would prefer to do that. He was found guilty and awaiting execution. The trial was a public one that was meant to deter any future coups and was broadcast for all of Ghana to see and hear. They were, you know, they were trading some things amongst themselves, the prosecution and the lawyers and whatnot, and severally and whatnot, those terms they use. So I got up and grabbed the microphone, you know, said, I don't understand these terms and all that's going on, neither do my boys. And I'm just here, and I'm taking responsibility for everything that's happened, and to leave my men alone. But I wanted to make sure that they, they hear what I have to say first. He made an unforgettable speech in court and said, I am not an expert in economics, and I am not an expert in law. But I am an expert in working on an empty stomach, wondering when and where the next meal will come from. I know what it feels like going to bed with a headache for want of food in the stomach. He was an embodiment of the uh, reaction, the disappointment, the great disappointment of the people of Ghana. Instead, the name Rawlings became the symbol of hope and deliverance for the people of Ghana. On the 4th of June of that same year, a mutiny by officers in support of his cause broke him out of jail, sparking the revolution. So what would that mean? That Yao Graham was in university then and remembers the mood of the time. It was in the middle of this split national mood that Jay Rawlings was arrested and reported as somebody who was planning to clean up the mess by overthrowing these people. Now it's important to, to, to understand this because he didn't say anything. The prosecution said this was what he was about. But such was the mood that people identified that actually this guy is saying exactly the way we are feeling. So he became a hero on account of the honesty of the prosecution. 
1979, I was almost uh, 10 years. Uh, if I recollect, that June 4th, when we heard that something had happened, I think it was on the news. That's the first time you know that something is going on. They start playing uh, Ghana National Anthem. So we knew that another person had taken control, charge of the country. But who, they were not really sure. Some people went and spied and realized that when he alighted from the helicopter, the men picked him up. And when we saw him, we started screaming, JJ, JJ. And my dad would shake his head and say, wow. <laughs> we are in trouble and our kids are hailing this man. When you consider, you know, the difficulties, the, sh the shock effect that June 4th should have had on us, should have woken us up. And I do remember, to be quite honest, in those volatile, violent, difficult days when people were calling for let the blood flow, etc. There were some intellectuals and some diplomats who, I guess, have a better knowledge of history who were asking me to, to that I was exercising too much control. I was restraining it too much. Jerry Rawlings and his soldiers formed the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, AFRC. I didn't expect to be here. Later, the AFRC carried out what Rawlings described as a house cleaning exercise. This was basically the identifying of leaders that were deemed corrupt. The leaders were either sentenced to prison for their crimes or, in some cases, executed by the AFRC. Three months later, on 24th September 1979, the AFRC allowed Hila Liman to head Ghana and a People's National Party, PNP. However, Hila Liman's presidency was short-lived. On 31st December 1981, after only two years as president, Liman's administration was cut short when Rawlings ousted him in yet another coup, claiming that his government was taking Ghana down a road of economic ruin. But it was his second coming, as we say, call it here, the 1981 coup d'etat, that then made him the figure that he is today. That was when people encountered him directly or indirectly. It was, it was a fairly difficult period. The PNDC is a government that is or should be run by the people. I ended up in office, not because I wanted to be chairman, to be head of state, but it was just my passion to see justice done, my love of freedom. That's what puts me always in this position or put me in this position. Rowling's government was called the Provisional National Defense Council, PNDC. PNDC was made up of both civilians and soldiers. government set about to restore the nation's pride and infrastructure through hard work, determination and mass inclusion. The politics of the country was being driven very much by ordinary people, by young people, particularly students, and a lot of the people who fanned out across the country to build the base for the PNDC. Students took months, university students took months from school to go and lift cocoa for export, the symbolism of that was very important. I belong to the generation that actually had to stop schooling and we had to go out working to get cocoa from the farms to the ports to be exported in other things. It brought us awareness. If earlier on we thought there was a thin divide between the people and government, now that alone told us that we are the government and it's the people who make up the government and that it is time for us to stand up for our own rights. That is what Jerry Lawrence represents for most of the people of my generation.
a hands-on leader, Rollins ensured the rebuilding of Ghana would be shared by all. Soldier and civilian took part with no task too big or too small. His passion is um, the underdog not being maltreated or mistreated. And looking at a situation where if we have, let's say, six million Ghanaians, he wants to bring all six million Ghanaians to a certain level of livelihood. I know him to be a passionate man. He wants things done uh, immediately. I always say Kwame Nkrumah always wants things done yesterday. And Rawlings wanted things done immediately, quick, quick. Uh, they have that one in common. He's the type who does not mind getting his hand dirty. He'll be passing here and maybe we are doing a cleanup. He'll come and join us. He'll just get and come and join you. He doesn't see himself as being above people. I remember one of the pictures. He was at uh, uh, Ashiyama cleaning gutter, and people were standing there folding their hands and looking at him inside the gutter. Your president. The young government was beginning to change the face of Ghana, but the economic reforms challenge they faced was one that caused Rowling's rule to change drastically. I remember in 1983, before the budget was presented, that budget devalued Ghana's currency from 2.75 CDs to the dollar to 29 CDs to the dollar. Previous governments have been overthrown for much smaller devaluations. The long-term effect of these economic policies has been to worsen inequality. <laughs> Rowling's government's response to its critics was to clamp down on opposition. The media in particular was hit hard. Haruna Atta, a journalist, shares his experience. Those were what one would describe as the bad old days when journalists were under siege, sort of. At that time, he was very much seen as the dictator uh, like the, the uh, quintessential African dictator. Rawlings and his government had to instill measures that before would seem to be a compromise of their status quo, dealing with the West. Pope John Paul described capitalism, the capitalist economic philosophy, as the savagery of capitalism. What are you going to say about us in the so-called developing world in Africa? Rollings is a man of many faces. There was a time I wanted to be a priest, you know. Yeah. Charismatic. How are you? I'm going to take you together with a flower. Oh. <laughs> and now, his long-time secret as an artist has been finally exposed. You may not believe it, but I'd much rather be known as an artist than as a president. Just as I would much rather probably be known for flying skill than being a president. Maybe it's because through this you can see my power of observation, my sense of precision, my, my striving for excellence. I don't know where you found this, but the point is, I've kept quiet about this thing because I haven't done my wife's portrait yet, you know? If I'd done my wife's portrait also, I would have felt good about, you know, displaying this. A family man, he's married to Dr. Nana Ajeman Rawlings, his childhood sweetheart. He doesn't remember. I remember. <laughs> The first place I met him in primary school at a school called Mrs. Sam's School. And he obviously didn't recognize me because I was black, I was dark. Because this lady was um, fair 
and there were a lot of fair kids in the school. And he actually, she actually used to discriminate against the, between the fair and the dark ones. So the fair ones knew each other and the dark ones knew each other. So he didn't see me, but I saw him. <laughs> It's just a joke I crack all the time. Nana, in the first place, was somebody I noticed from the age of 14, somebody I've been in love with. It wasn't until about five, six years later that I could even, she would even allow me to hold her hands type of thing. Oh, it took a long time. Together, they have four children. As Anata, Amina, Ya Asentwa, and the only son, Kimadi Rawlings. As if to protect them, Rawlings being in the center stage of politics created a deliberate wedge between his children and himself. In the event that his life would be taken, his children would be able to cope in his absence. I avoided my daughters, you know, for some years. I mean, I'd see them, but I did not want to develop any emotional attachment with them. I mean, I longed for it. I wanted to hug them and things like that, but I was afraid if we developed that emotional attachment and something happened, you know, uh, I wasn't too sure how they would be able to cope or, or handle it. And that's why I kept that distance, you see what I mean? Deliberately, because of what I, the reason I just gave. There was not a good balance in terms of um, family and work. So I had to be mother and father to them almost throughout their life till they were adults. Yeah. It wasn't easy. He is also famous for being stubborn. In being stubborn, mind you, while I was in high office as chairman of the PNDC within the revolution or head of state, my stubbornness did not translate itself into stopping our people from doing something that I felt would, would, would hurt us. One would sometimes allow it in order not to break the growing confidence in our people. They sometimes needed to make a mistake. My stubbornness did not stand in the way. In the early 1990s, the African continent began to experience a new wave of political structure, the return of multi-party politics. Much like the 1960s, as country after country gained independence from colonial powers, now the people wanted more. Rawlings, always able to read the mood of the people, was quick to embrace it changing his government from military to civilian. He did not fight against it, but he did say that, though he personally did not uh, believe in multi-party politics, but if that's what Ghanaians want, they would have it. So the constitution was uh, written and from 1992 to the present. We've had one of the most stable democracies in Africa. As required by the constitutional mandate, Rowling's term of office ended in 2001 and was succeeded by John Kufour, his main political rival. People like to make all kinds of claims about Rawlings that he didn't want to hand over. Absolute rubbish. I will use this occasion to tell them something that they never imagined. Had we, any one of us, dared to suggest that we're going to stay on for one more day would have lost the complete support of the masses. Jerry Rawlings is not your typical serious military man. He can also humor a crowd. My colleague, uh, ministers of state, honorable lecturers of the various faculties, your excellencies, distinguished ladies, and gentlemen, I think I prefer the lady. Preferably. I prefer the lady. <laughs> oh. 
I mean, this little warmth you want to enjoy, you want to come and While he was president, Rawlings was able to use a grant of $50,000 from the Hunger Project cash prize he had won as seed money to sponsor the establishment of the University of Development Studies, a state-owned university, the first of its kind in the northern region of Ghana. Before UDS was cited, people who attained higher education, most of them had to travel for two days in order to get to school. That tells you how desperate it was for people in the north to get educated. In 2010, Jerry Rawlings was named the African Union envoy to Somalia. I believe the African Union has every reason to feel proud. This is one political and military exercise that we've taken up almost on our own and won for the good of that country, for the good of all of us. During his time as envoy, Somalia, as well as other parts of Northeast Africa, experienced a catastrophic famine that the world called an emergency. Jerry Rawlings was on the ground to see the results of the famine and was deeply moved at the sorry state of the mothers and children he met. In an interview with CNN, Rowling shared his distressful experience. When you look at the resilience, the, the, the fortitude, the, the strength in these mothers, you know, holding onto these feeble, fragile children, as sorry as you feel for them, you cannot help but also admire you know, their sense of courage and determination. I mean, let's do what we can. You're, you're clearly moved by what you saw. You may like him, you may not like him, you may agree with some of his methods or you may not agree with some of his methods, but you cannot be in denial. You shouldn't be in denial because he's occupied a major part of the country's history. After 18 years in power, where you can say that actually, if you look at the sweep of Ghanaian history, Jerry Rawlings is the second most important ruler in Ghana's history after Kwame Nkrumah. Nelson Mandela once said, when a man has done what he considers to be his duty to his people and his country, he can rest in peace. This perhaps is the case of the boy who had a dream to fly, and to fly he did, but he also became president. John Jerry Rawlings, the man who came, saw and conquered.